Well, welcome to the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center's Curator's Corner. My name is Thorne Tritter. I'm the Museum and Programming Director at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center, which is located in Glen Cove, New York. This online program, as many of you know, is part of a weekly series that we started well, almost a year ago, probably now, uh, to look in particular at objects and images in our collection at a time when many people weren't able to make it to our museum. Our building is open seven days a week now. So although we do encourage you to give us a call and arrange your tickets in advance just so that we can maintain separation in our galleries, but we're continuing to do these programs about the objects and images in our collection as a way to draw attention to them. Um, as always, let me encourage you, if you have questions during the presentation, please type them in the Q&A window and I'll make sure to get time to respond or give time to respond to them at the end. I also need to share one piece of bad news, which is that we have been having some trouble with our internet and apparently it often seems to go out for up to five minutes at 1220, which falls unfortunately right in the middle of my presentation. So I don't think I'm gonna finish by 1220. So if for, for some reason, if our internet goes out, I will come back as soon as it returns. So just uh, hold on, re-log in. It may require you to re-log in, but hopefully it won't happen. But I wanted to warn you that that's a possibility. Okay, onward. Today, I'm gonna talk about this photograph in our gallery that was taken during the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in 1943. Here you can see the caption we include. As you may know, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising started on April 19th, 1943. So the 78th anniversary of that took place just earlier this week. Um, in addition to the anniversary on the Gregorian calendar, every year people around the world mark the anniversary of the uprising on the Jewish calendar, marked by the 27th day of Nisan, and that is Yom HaShoah. Uh, we and other organizations held special programming on Yom HaShoah. And I spoke two weeks ago about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising when I spoke about a quote in our memorial garden from Vlad Kamid, who was one of the resistance fighters in the ghetto. But given the anniversary just two days ago, I felt like it was appropriate to talk about this image from our museum in my program today. Um, to give you a bit of background, as you will recall, the Nazis invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939, and marched into Warsaw by the end of the month on September 29th. They and the Soviets then, who had attacked on September 17th, then divided up Poland. In Warsaw, under Nazi control, after months of gradually tightening restrictions that included the confiscation of Jewish property and the conscription of Jewish men for slave labor, the Nazis began the creation of a ghetto in the spring of 1940. In March, they designated a portion of the city as the epidemics area. And beginning on April 1st, 1940, the Nazis ordered the construction of a 10 foot high brick wall to separate this one part of the city, the epidemics area, from the surrounding areas. This is another photograph actually that we have in our museum that shows the construction of the wall in Warsaw. In early October of 1940, the Nazis renamed the area as the Jewish Quarter and forced the Jews of Warsaw and from the surrounding area to move into this one small area in the city. A month later, on November 16th, 1940, uh, the ghetto gates were closed and the Nazis sealed the Jews in. More than 450,000 Jews, representing about a third of Warsaw's pre-war population, was forced into an area that made up about two and a half percent of the city's geographical space. Historians and others talk about the sealing off of the ghetto because it wasn't just that the Jews were locked into this kind of confined area, but the Nazis controlled and restricted uh, the flow of all goods in and out of the ghetto, including most notably food, fuel, and medicine. The overcrowding and disease and hunger are hard to imagine. Some 83,000 people in the ghetto died of starvation in the first 18 months. Then in July of 1942, the Nazis announced that they would be deporting residents of the ghetto for resettlement. 
some of the residents believed the German announcements that the deportations would secure a better life, that they were going to be resettled somewhere else. Others, however, began to question whether the Nazis could be trusted and what they actually meant by resettlement. Rumors spread in particular that the Nazis were killing those who were boarded onto those trains. Now we know that was the case, with most of the deportations going to the killing center at Treblinka, where the vast majority of Warsaw's Jews were murdered in gas chambers. At the time, however, there was far less knowledge about what was going on and what was happening to those who boarded the trains for resettlement. The uncertainty bred division within the ghetto, with some calling for outright resistance to the Nazis, but others who believed the Nazis or who feared the reprisal if they did something against them. As the ghetto population shrank, as more and more Jews were deported and murdered in Treblinka and other killing centers, that, uh, that group that was left started to rally around the idea of resistance as more and more news trickled in about what was going on to Jews who had left. And the divisions that had pre previously divided the community about whether to resist or not fell away. Vlad Kamid, who I spoke about a couple of weeks ago, wrote later about the planning, and you can see her description here about this uh, beginning of preparation to resist in ways that they all had wanted to do for so long. The first major action came on January 18th, 1943, when a group of Jewish fighters armed with weapons that they'd managed to smuggle into the ghetto joined a column of Jews who were being marched to the deportation point. And at a prearranged signal, they broke rank, ranks and began to fire at the German guards. In the chaos, the Jews who had been being marched to the trains managed to escape into the various buildings. But the Nazis then sent in reinforcements and rounded up whatever Jews they could find, about 5,000 who were forced onto those trains regardless of the previous planning. In the wake of that initial fight though, the Nazis suspended any further deportations. So the people who were meant to be deported on January 18th did not get deported, another group of 5,000 people did, and then the deportations were halted. The Nazis, however, were not giving in to the resistance, but rather using the time to plan for the full, um, the full removal of everyone in the ghetto and the emptying of the ghetto. Information leaked out to the resistance groups that in mid-April of 1943, the Nazis would enter the ghetto and begin rounding up everybody for deportation. Those in the ghetto, facing almost certain death, began planning for a larger uprising, smuggling more weapons in or chemicals or whatever they could find to create their own tools to fight the Nazis. On April 19th, 1943, the Nazis marched in planning a complete emptying of the ghetto in what they thought would take three days. But they were met by an ambush of Jews in the ghetto who used those guns and handmade weapons, Molotov cocktails, handmade grenades, to attack the Nazi column. The Germans suffered 59 casualties and their advance bogged down. The SS police commander, yeah, there he is, Ferdinand von Sommern Frankenegg, who'd overseen the sending of about 250,000 Jews to the deaths at Treblinka, ordered or called on the Luftwaffe to bomb that part of the city. But he was relieved of his command and court-martialed for his ineptitude. He was later also killed by Yugoslav partisans in Croatia. Himmler, the head of the SS, replaced Samarin Frankenegg with Jürgen Stroop, an SS officer who'd been serving in the SS and police, as the SS and police commander in Lvov, or Lviv as it is now. Stroop took a different approach, ordering that the entire ghetto be systematically burned down and blown up building by building. All of the survivors, including men, women, and children, were either killed on the spot or deported to killing centers. Not surprisingly, given that Stroop had two battalions of the Waffen SS, as well as hundreds of other police and army soldiers, he was able to squash the rebellion. On May 16th, 1943, so 
just about a month after the uprising had started, as a sign of his as a sign of his success, Stroop had the Great Warsaw Synagogue, the main synagogue in Warsaw, destroyed. Stroop wrote daily reports to his superior in Krakow and for Heinrich Himmler about what he was doing during that period from April 19th to May 16th. On May 1st, for example, he wrote, progress of large scale operation on 1 May 1943, start 0900 hours, 10 searching parties were detailed. Moreover, a larger battle group was detailed to comb out a certain block of buildings with the added instruction to burn that block down. Today's operation, a total of 1,026 Jews were caught, of whom 245 were killed either in battle or while resisting. These are the kinds of reports that he was sending back, detailed reports highlighting what he was doing and his success. Sometime in late May, Stroop's superior in Krakow, a guy named Friedrich Kruger, who oversaw all the police in the German-occupied Poland, commissioned Stroop to write a detailed report summarizing his entire actions in Warsaw for Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS. Stroop used his daily reports as a basis for this larger summary. He also included 53 photographs that have been taken by one of four different photographers who had captured the activities of the Nazi forces in the ghetto on film. Our photograph is one of those 53 pictures included in what became known as the Stroop Report. I wanted to share some of the other photos in that report to give you a sense of that larger book. And I've included the captions that Stroop included, which give you some sense of his biases and the messages that he was trying to convey or the larger message he was trying to convey. So he talked about this photo that we have on display as forcing these people from the bunkers. In another, he referred to, and in many of them, he referred to the Jews as bandits. And another one with the same subtitle as the one or same caption as the one that we show, but another group of prisoners uh, after they've been arrested. There's several that show Stroop himself, including this one, and that you can see he labeled it leader of the grand operation, so a bit of a sense of his own importance. The report, which ran 125 pages, was originally entitled The Jewish Quarter of Warsaw is No More. It was meant to serve as a souvenir album for Himmler, with other copies all bound in leather for Stroop and Kruger, the guy in charge in Warsaw. The Stroop report, excuse me, the Stroop report is for me a sign of how the Nazis completely upended any sense of morality that existed before. They have appear to have believed so securely in their eventual victory and a future that fit into this Nazi vision of a world without Jews that they imagined that this album about the destruction of the Warsaw Ghetto and the murder of thousands was something that they would look fondly on later in later years. One of the scholars who studied the Stroop report believes Stroop included our picture to make it clear to Himmler that he had overcome any kind of Judeo-Christian morality uh, about killing women and children and that he was emphasizing that he felt no compunction about killing those innocent people. And you saw in some of the other pictures, there's, there's many that show women and non-combatants but he wanted to emphasize that he was willing to kill those people. I have to admit, I find Stroop's vision and the report deeply disturbing. In the end, however, the Stroop report served an entirely different purpose than what Jurgen Stroop had imagined. After the war, the Allies discovered two copies of the report, including the one that was in the collection of Heinrich Himmler, and they introduced those copies as evidence at the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg in 1946, where Chief U.S. Prosecutor Robert Jackson showed it to the judges during his opening statement to highlight the persecution of the Jews by the Nazis. After the trial in Nuremberg, the Stroop Report was turned over to Polish authorities, who used it in their 1951 trial of Jurgen Stroop. 
Stroop had already been found guilty and been sentenced to death in an American military tribunal in 1946 in Dachau, but the Polish government wanted to have their own trial. And the Stroop report became a key piece of evidence in that Polish trial, which found Stroop guilty of mass murder and that hanged Stroop in Poland in March of 1952. In the years after the trials, the Stroop Report, and particularly the photographs, were published, putting a face to some of the nameless victims of the Holocaust. Our photograph is perhaps the most well-known picture from the Stroop Report. In 2016, Time magazine included it in its list of 100 most influential photographs in history, writing, the Holocaust produced scores of searing images but none had the evidentiary impact of the boy's surrender. The child whose identity has never been confirmed has come to represent the face of the six million defenseless Jews killed by the Nazis. Several books have been written about the photograph, including A Child at Gunpoint by Richard Raskin, The Boy by Dan Porat, and Frederick Rousseau's The Jewish Child of Warsaw, A History of a, Photogra of a Photograph. Raskin highlighted the dramatic difference between the way we see the photograph today compared to the way Stroop and the Nazis saw it, writing one set of men in that photograph saw that mess. one set of men saw in that photograph heroic soldiers combating humanity's dregs, while the vast majority of mankind sees here the gross inhumanity of man. Let me turn back to our photograph. There have been many efforts to try to identify the people in the photograph, particularly the boy who's at the center of the image. But as Time Magazine noted, there has been no final agreement. In the 1950s, several people proposed that the boy was a man named Artur Semiatek, born in Wovich in 1935. Semiatek was from a well-off family, and his father had been the member, a member of the Judenrat in the Vovich ghetto, which was emptied in 1941, and those in it moved to the Warsaw ghetto. Um, so it made sense that he would have been there. And in the 1970s, a cousin of Semiatek, who lived in Warsaw but had fled to the Soviet Union in 1939, and survived the Holocaust, signed several affidavits that swore that the boy in the photo was Artur. However, there have been other claims as well. In 1982, Svi Nussbaum, who had been born in 1936 and survived in the Warsaw Ghetto, stated that he might well be the boy, as he recalled being forced to put his arms up when he was arrested by the Nazis. And almost two decades later, in 1999, a 95-year-old man named Avrahim Zelenwarger told the ghetto fighter's house in Israel that the boy in the photo was his son, Levi Zelenwarger, who'd been born in 1932. Other names have also been suggested, but it seems unlikely that we will ever know for sure. The only identification that is certain in the photograph is this man, the SS man aiming a gun near the boy. He was Joseph Blosch, who'd been born in the Sudetenland in 1912 and served in the Einsatzgruppen when the war started, the special group of soldiers who were given the task of killing Jews and other Polish leaders to, before there was any kinds of camps or ghettos. In 1943, he was a policeman employed in the Warsaw Ghetto during the uprising, and records show that, during, that due to his performance during the suppression of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, Blush was actually awarded the War Merit Cross second class with swords. Blush, not surprisingly, appears in several of the photographs in the Stroop Report. When he was brought to trial in East Germany, the photographs were used as circumstantial evidence for the prosecution, and he was convicted of the murder of at least 2,000 people. He was executed in 1969. When asked about the photographs, Blasch stated, this picture shows me as a member of the Gestapo office in the Warsaw Ghetto, together with a group of SS members, driving a large number of Jewish citizens out from a house. The group of Jewish citizens is comprised predominantly of children, women, and old people driven out of a house through a gateway with their arms raised. 
The Jewish citizens were then led to the so-called Umschlagplatz, from which they were transported to the extermination camp at Treblinka. During the trial, the judge asked Blush, particularly about why he pointed a submachine gun at a small boy and how the inhabitants had reacted at the time. Blush responded, they, the people they arrested, were in tremendous dread. But we, he said, witness scenes like these daily. We could not even think, he said. I wanted to mention one other person who is associated with the photograph. He's not actually in the photograph, but he was the photographer, SS Commander Franz Conrad. He confessed to taking some of the photographs in the Stroop album, although others, as I mentioned, were taken by a special propaganda unit that included three other photographers. Conrad was born in Austria and before the war in 1932 had been sent to jail there for small robbery. Not a very appealing guy. He was released. He joined the illegal Austrian SS and the Nazi party, which was banned in Austria in June of 33. In July of 34, he actually participated in an attempted coup in Austria and was arrested, but managed to escape and flee to Germany, where he joined a special unit of the SS that was under Hitler's direct command. He served in various capacities during the war, but in 1943, he was in charge of an SS enterprise devoted to collecting, sorting, and storing all the transportable property that the Jews had left behind in the deserted apartments in various buildings in Warsaw and in the ghetto as they were deported. He become, became known as the king of the ghetto. He was in charge of uh, distributing and selling all these items through a series of warehouses that stored furniture, mattresses, tables, kitchenware, porcelain, books, musical instruments, pretty much anything that the Jews had owned, he collected, and, and collected it and then sold it. After the war, Franz Conrad was, Conrad was arrested and tried along with Jürgen Stroop in Warsaw, where the photographs from the Stroop report were again part of the evidence. Conrad claimed to have taken the photograph and several others so that he could complain to Adolf Hitler about Stroop's brutality. The court, however, didn't believe that defense. He was convicted of personally murdering seven Jews and deporting a thousand others to death camps. He was sentenced to death and executed in 1952. There is something satisfying about the way the photographs and the Stroop report were eventually used to bring justice against Stroop, Blush, and Conrad. You might notice actually on this cover image from one of the copies of the Stroop report, there's notations from the Nuremberg Tribunal. However, our photograph and the others from the Stroop report have often been misunderstood. And I think you could actually see that in that Times Magazine quote. In particular, many have commented that these photos show the passivity of Jews, as they were apparently willingly marched off to their deaths. That image, of course, is completely false. The photographs from the Stroop report, like this one, were taken in the wake of a massive uprising where the people shown in these pictures had actively fought with whatever weapons they could manufacture or find against the strongest military force at the time. The photographs, however, were taken by the perpetrators and so show the image that the Nazis wanted to publicize. They don't show the aggressive acts by the Jews. They don't highlight the resistance. And in this way, I think we need to be careful about interpreting our picture and the others in the Stroop report. I'd like you to think about what must it have been like moments before the photograph was taken, before these Jews were captured by the Nazis. These same people, shown here with their arms in the air, would have been holding weapons, throwing anything from grenades to rocks at the Nazis and doing all they could to fight back. That's the image that we should hold in our minds as much as the ones that, we kept, that were captured on film. The fact is that the spirit of resistance seen in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising also spread outward from Warsaw. In August of 1943, just a couple of months after the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising had been squashed, around a thousand Jewish prisoners in Treblinka 
revolted, drawing on supplies that had been smuggled in from those who came from the Warsaw Ghetto and learning about the events in Warsaw. The prisoners set several buildings on fire, blew up a gasoline storage tank, and attacked the main gate. While most of those who rebelled in Treblinka were killed, some 200 escaped from the camp. And in the same month that Jews rebelled in Treblinka, they also launched an uprising in the Bialystok ghetto, drawing, again, at least partially, on word that had spread about the events in Warsaw, a group of several hundred Jews launched an attack on the Nazis who were planning the large-scale murder of all the Jews in the Bialystok ghetto. With limited weapons and handmade bombs, the Jews fought in pockets against the far lord larger Nazi force. Like in Warsaw, the Nazi response was to burn the Bialystok, Bialystok ghetto down, squashing the uprising. But several dozen managed to escape into the surrounding forests and joined the local partisans. The Jewish death toll in these uprisings was horrendous, but there was little expectation by the resistance that they would defeat the Nazis. The goal was not to win, it was to disrupt the Nazi killing machine, if only for a little bit, and to not go down quietly. In 1968, on the 25th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, one of the ghetto fighter survivors, Yitzhak Zuckerman, said the important thing about the uprising was inherent in the force shown by Jewish youth after years of degradation to rise up against their destroyers and determine what death they would choose, Treblinka or uprising. So when you look at this photograph in our gallery, I hope you will think about the victims and their humanity, but also think about their inner strength that led them to fight in ways that are obscured or hidden by this photograph. Okay, let me stop there. Thank you for watching, of course. If you have questions, please type them in the Q&A window. Let me take a moment to remind you of some of our other upcoming programs. Tomorrow evening at 7 p.m., we, in conjunction with the David Taub Real Upstander Film Series, is holding a virtual screening of a documentary called Bullied, which tells the story of a gay high school student whose legals battle helped him secure justice. And the film highlights the importance of confronting anti-gay bullying. The program will include, include commentary and a Q&A with clinical social worker Stephen Mast, who's been serving the Long Island community for more than three decades. This coming Sunday at 1 p.m., we're holding a commemoration of the Armenian genocide. As you may know, April 24th is Armenian Genocide Awareness Day. Um, our program is going to include a presentation from an Armenian family who live here in Glencove, two of whom will actually be joining us live from Yerevan in Armenia. And one more program to mention, we were supposed to hold our yoga program today outside behind our building in the Wellwind Preserve, but rain got in the way. So we have postponed that program, our yoga class, until next Wednesday. So I hope some of you will come to the... Uh, calming, beautiful surroundings of the Wellwind Preserve and enjoy the yoga class at 10 a.m. next week. Okay, you can find more information about these and all our virtual programming on our website at www.hmtcli.org and click on the events tab. I hope you'll also click on the Give Now button that's on our homepage and make a donation to support programs like this. Okay, let me turn to some of your questions. Uh, did non-Jewish Polish partisans assist the Jews in the rebellion? Uh, yes, that's definitely the case. There were non-Jewish Poles who were assisting in the collection of supplies and of armaments who, and who helped bring those or get those into the ghetto. There was a larger uh, Polish home army that was, many hoped that it, they would get involved, but they held off but there were a number of non-Jewish Poles who became important in the, the, the ghetto uprising. Um, there was also a follow-up uh, rebellion by the larger non-Jewish Poles a year later after the ghetto had been empty. Another question, do you know if the Nazis tried to turn people who were Jewish against other people who were Jewish? Were people aware that was happening? For sure that was happening. 
Uh, the Nazis used all, all kinds of pressure from physical violence to rewards for people who would uh, report on fellow Jews. Uh, people who, were, who believed that they would get special treatment for the Nazis, Jews who believed they would get special treatment, uh, or Jews who did get special treatment from the Nazis in return for uh, ta tattling or, or you know, informing on some of the others. Uh, there's, in, in all kinds of accounts of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, there are, in the period leading up to it, there are all kinds of previous efforts that got, that the Nazis found out about and were able to stop before they took place because of this kind of, um, this effort to get Jews to turn on themselves. Could I comment on the unique non-Jewish Warsaw Uprising a year later that, inspired, that was inspired by the Jewish Rebellion? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it took place right as the Red Army was approaching. There was a second uprising 